Hi everyone, and welcome back to week four of the Theological Foundations class. For this week and the next, we're going to be taking a look at each of the theological categories in, in more detail. But first, I need to make a disclaimer that applies to all of the videos for the next two weeks. These are just an overview survey, not a detailed description of each doctrine. Therefore, please, please, please do not think that we've covered everything or given you the whole story. Because these surveys, they're not exhaustive, they, they have the possibility of skewing the truth slightly by their incompleteness. Now, I'm working hard so that everything I say is true and accurate as far as it goes, but if you take this for the whole truth, you could be misled into an imbalance because of what I'm, I just don't have the time to say. So please don't let your theological understanding of these topics stop here. And in addition, for time's sake, I'm not giving you all the biblical evidence for everything that I'm saying. I'm only giving you the synthesis and the so what for each of these topics. Now, you probably have seen, I very strongly believe that theology needs to be based directly on the Bible. And I believe I've done that in putting these videos together. I just haven't taken the time to show all the background work in the videos themselves. I'm just showing you the result. So I'm asking you to trust that these are biblical to the best of my ability. And I'm also challenging you to double check this for yourself. Go to the Bible and see if it's true. Okay? Now the first two videos of this week are about theology proper. The doctrine of God himself. We're going to talk about his nature and character. And because God is so awesome and there's so much to talk about, I'm going to break this into two videos. This first video is going to cover a general introduction to God. And then the second video will talk more extensively about the attributes of God. First, we're going to talk about God's name. The, the word God is actually not God's name, but rather a category description. It's like calling one of us human, because the word God is a generic term for deity. Now, it's totally legitimate to use this term about our God, and it's even cool to address him by this term, but it's not his name. He's actually revealed his proper name in the Bible. And the name of God tells us a lot about him. It's a revelation of his character. Now, there are few places in the Bible itself that, that says that God is revealing his name specifically. The first place I want to talk about is where God reveals his personal name. And it's in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, starting at verse 13. It comes in the context of the burning bush where God meets Moses and promises that he's going to rescue his people from Egypt. And when Moses asks, what name should I use to tell the Israelites when they ask me, you know, which God is sending you? God answers and he says, tell them, I am who I am. And then he says, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Now, if you're looking at your Bible, most Bibles, the the words the Lord in this passage are all in capital letters. That's to represent that this is not a, a translation of the word that means Lord or Master, but is actually a representation of God's proper name. Because the ancient Jews thought his name was too special to even speak, it's usually represented in our Bible by the title the Lord. Now, Actually, we're, we're not 100% sure how this name is pronounced, but it's probably pronounced something like Yahweh or Yahweh. And this word is related to the Hebrew for He is or I am when God is saying it. So the personal name of God is basically He is. When Moses asks, what kind of God are you? God answers, I am. And when Mo Moses is to tell about him, he's supposed to say, he is. 
That means that God is the self-existing one, the self-defining one. That means there, there's nothing else by which we can define God except himself and his own existence. We don't define God by our standards, by our understanding, by our experience, by t- taking something we know and comparing God to that. We don't fit God into our reality. We seek to fit ourselves into God's reality. The second place God reveals his name I want to talk about is in Exodus chapter 33 and 34. Moses asks God, show me your glory. And the Lord says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And the story goes on. Moses goes up to the mountain. Then it says, the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with Moses and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. And it says Moses responded to this by bowing down to the ground and worshiping. Now, Notice from this passage a few things. The first is that God's glory is his goodness. Not just raw power, but benevolence and power. And notice his absolute freedom in giving mercy and compassion. And notice that his name, the Lord, the the same word, the same name that means he is, is proclaimed and then elaborated. His name is compassionate and gracious. He is kind towards those in need. He is merciful. His name is slow to anger, patient, long-suffering. His name is abounding in covenant faithfulness and truth. His name is protecting, preserving covenant love to thousands. His name is forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And his name is that he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He is fully just. From all of this, it's revealed that God is both gracious and just. Now, the third place God reveals his name that I want to talk about is in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, where we see that God's name is revealed to be Jesus. Now, the name Jesus means the Lord saves. It is God's nature to rescue because it is God's nature to be gracious and forgiving. And we see the name of God most fully proclaimed and we see the glory of God most fully displayed. We see the power of God most fully exercised and we see the wisdom of God most fully carried out in the foolishness, weakness, and despisedness of the immortal God dying on the cross. And the last place I want to mention where God reveals his name is two verses later in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. And here we see God's name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is present by his spirit. He's not a God far off and unavailable. Because God has revealed himself in the loving, saving, present, uncreated foundation of all reality. We need to be conformed to his reality instead of expecting him to conform to ours. He is the defining standard of everything. Now in the next video, we're going to talk more about God's attributes. But first, we need to investigate a a characteristic of God that kind of overarchs all of God's qualities, and that is God's holiness. God's holiness is his primary attribute. 
Holiness is not a characteristic like any others. It's an umbrella concept that covers all of his attributes. His love is a holy love. His justice is holy justice, etc. Now, the meaning of holiness is primarily uniqueness, separateness. There's nothing like God. See, everything that exists can divide, be divided into two categories. God and everything else. Creator and created. God is in a class by himself. There's absolutely nothing to compare with him. Nothing close. God himself is the definition of holiness. And then from there, his, his moral purity is a secondary understanding of his holiness. God is too holy to allow any hint uh, of a, any possibility of sin. It is impossible for God to do any evil. And it is impossible for God to allow any sin in his creatures to go unpunished. Therefore, the biblical implication that he, he always spells out is he calls his people to be holy because he is holy. We need to be different from non-believers in our worldview, attitude, values, and actions because God is different. He is holy. And the next fundamental characteristic of God I want to talk about is that he exists in Trinity. The idea of Trinity is a somewhat difficult to understand concept. And there are things about it that are just beyond our ability to grasp because God exists on a higher level of reality than we do. Just as you shouldn't expect an insect to fully understand us humans, we shouldn't expect to be able to fully understand God. So there's a bit of mystery about the concept of Trinity, uh, and we're better off not trying to make the, the mystery disappear. However, we can clearly state what God has revealed and what the Christian church has confessed as, as orthodox belief about the Trinity. The doctrine of Trinity is not directly stated in the Bible in so many words, but it is clearly derived from some things that the Bible clearly does say. First, God is one. There's only one God. That, that is made clear in the Old and New Testament. But secondly, there are three distinct persons. They're different. The Father is not the same as the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit. They are distinguishable. And in some places, they're, they're all present in different ways at the same time. And the third thing we need to think about is that all three are God. The Father is God. Jesus, the Son, is fully God in the same way that the Father is. He's not a, a, a second level kind of God. He's not God light. And the Holy Spirit is God in the same way as the Father and the Son. And finally, all three are a unity. The three are unified in nature, purpose, work, and love. Now, I understand, on the surface, it may, it may seem like a contradiction to say that God is one and God is three. I mean, basic mathematics, one is not three. The key to understanding this is to realize that God is one in a different way than God is three. And this is a mystery beyond our full ability to comprehend. The, the standard language is that God is one God, one nature, in three persons. And all three persons are equal in essence and dignity and works. But there is a differentiation in their roles and in the way that they are revealed to us. But overall, there's a unity. There's only one God who exists as Father Son, and Spirit. Now, the classic Trinitarian formulas in the Christian creeds try and guard these truths by neither separating the substance, the being of God, or by confusing the persons of God. All three are equally God, yet there, there's not three separate gods, but one God in three persons. 
Okay? Well, so what? What difference does the doctrine of Trinity make for our Christian life? Actually, if we think about it, it should make a lot of difference. First, God is relationship. God is love. The reality of love and relationship is not something that exists outside of God, but is a part of His very nature. See, long before anything else existed, God was love, existing as community. God has never been lonely. God has never been needy. God did not lack anything that would force Him to create uh, out of necessity because He wanted someone to talk to. But the, the highest level of reality, relationship and love, is inherent in God Himself and comes from God Himself. And without Trinity, we lose the personhood of God. And our God is relational because He's relationship personified. And actually, it, it, the good news is that God draws us into that relationship. God can be known. He's revealed by the Son who perfectly reveals by being fully God that we might have the love for His Son that the Father has for the Son and that we, we can experience that holy love relationship that God has for Himself. And this is what we're created for. Okay, now let's turn the corner and prepare for our discussion of God's characteristics, which we're going to cover in more detail in the next video. First, let me talk about the definition of attributes. The attributes of God are just characteristics of God. They, they answer the question, what is God like? And I have to say, the primary answer to that is, wow, God is awesome in every sense of the word. But we, we can break it down and go a little bit further. However, that's, that's actually not an easy discussion to have because we're back against the problem. How can we describe a God who's beyond our imagination? Isaiah chapter 40 says, To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare Him to? So in one sense, God defies all our description. But in another sense, we can and we should talk about God because He has revealed Himself. When we talk about God's attributes, it's only because God has faithfully, clearly disclosed things about Himself that we can trust, and therefore we can know Him. So His attributes are His uncommon characteristics which are worthy of praise. The, the excellence of His character, to use First Peter's words. The manifestation of His divine nature. God's excellencies, the traits of His greatness, His perfections, His marvelous characteristics. And when we talk about God's attributes, we need to speak of these things with wonder, joy, excitement, and worship. How great is our God? Well, let me ask, what is the relationship of the attributes of God to the nature of God? Are his attributes something different from his nature? Are they, are they like clothes which he could take off and then put on different attributes tomorrow? No. His attributes are not different from his nature. As if he could be any other kind of God that he wanted. He's not constrained by his attributes as something that's different from himself. But his attributes are just a way to talk about specific aspects of His perfection. It, his attributes are His nature. He couldn't be anything else, or He would be less than perfect. And His attributes are undivided. See, when we talk about the multiple attributes of God, we're not describing different parts of God. He, he's not like, 10% love and 10% justice and 10% something else. But all of, all of God is all of His attributes. He's 100% gracious. He's 100% faithful. All of His attributes come out in all that He does. 
They're not divided. They're just different ways to talk about the totality of what he is. So the next question, what's the relationship of the attributes of God to the actions and works of God's? Are his attributes something different from his deeds, from what he does? I don't have to answer that. Yes. His attributes are not the same thing as his works. His works are the outflow of his nature and attributes. But they're not a necessary outflow. That would put something outside of God that compels him to do something. He doesn't have to act compassionately by some constraint outside of himself. Rather, that's just a natural outflow of the perfection that he is compassionate. For example, his wrath is the natural outflow of his justice and righteousness. His goodness and his saving action is an outflow of his benevolence, grace, and mercy. Now, from our perspective, we often know his attributes only through his works. He, he doesn't reveal his attributes in the abstract. He reveals his compassion by actually being compassionate. He, he reveals his justice by making judgment, etc., so how can we talk about God's attributes? How can we have a mental framework to organize them and understand them? Now, there's many possible ways to classify God's attributes, um, and they're not bad. Because God is so big and awesome, many ways to describe Him are not only appropriate, but in some ways necessary to get the whole picture. In the next video, we're going to describe a threefold classification of God's attributes and describe these characteristics in more detail. But for now, let me summarize the main point of this video. God has revealed His personal name, that He is self-existent, gracious, free, and present to save. And God's primary characteristic is His holiness. He is different from everything else that exists. And he's revealed that he exists as a Trinitarian relationship. And there are many ways to describe God, which we're going to explore in more detail in the next video. Okay? So what? What now? Let me give you a few takeaway points and what you can do with them. First, we should recognize and practically live with God as both the foundation and the pinnacle of all of our world. He is the foundation of reality. Everything is about God. He's the uncreated cause and goal of all creation. Second, we should revel in God's holiness and strive to be holy because He is holy. And third, we should delight in God's Trinitarian nature and seek to participate in that love relationship. This is partly expressed in our relationship with others in Christ. And finally, we should think clearly about and delight in all the perfections of God's characteristics. God's character should change our character. Now, as I've mentioned, the details of God's character we're going to look at in more detail in the next video. And I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Thanks for watching.